Hello. Hi. I'm Eric Huang. This is Arthur Alem. Um, we're here from Facebook. I'm very excited to talk to you about our new portal product that we just launched and you can now purchase in stores as of last week. Um, we're going to be diving into the smart camera feature of the portal product and kind of going into how we can use that to build compelling video presence on top of traditional RTC video calling and some of the challenges that we faced. So Portal, as the name kind of suggests, is all about bridging people and places. At the heart of this on the video calling stack is the smart camera feature, which tries to simulate a digital camera operator, if you will, that moves with you through your space, trying to capture what you're doing and present it to the other side so that A, you have a hands-free experience, and B, the other person on the other side always feels like that they're there standing with you. And you don't get that sense of distance that you often get with standard video calling. So we've taken this idea and we built it from the ground up, starting with the hardware. Uh, we have a 140 degree field of view lens, which is pretty darn wide and can cover most home spaces. And we back it with a 4K sensor uh, that lets us get, gives us the range to zoom in on the action in that space. So let's see a demo of this. So this isn't my home. Uh, but in this demo, you'll see that the smart camera is going to track me as I move around this environment. And one of the key tenants that we wanted as we're building this is we wanted it to feel as smooth and natural as possible, not have any sort of weird sort of motions. Now at this point, Arthur is going to enter the scene from the left. And it's going to now include him as well. You'll see in the top left corner, this is actually the other side of the call. Uh, just to kind of give you a sense of what the difference in FOV. And sort of in that experience itself. So now Arthur's going to engage the spotlight feature, which is a, a way for people to just attract one person. You'll see on the self view that he's completely invisible, or he's not even visible anymore at that point. So now I'm going to come up and disable the spotlight feature. So at the core of the smart camera is our ability to observe and interpret the world around us. And obviously, people are a very important element of what we're doing, and so we put a lot of time and effort making sure that we can robustly figure out where people are and properly frame them. A very natural first approach uh, when looking at solving this type of problem space is to consider something like face detection or face localization, as I have it here. Uh, face detection is great and works in quite a lot of different environments, uh, but it's not quite robust enough to the different types of environments that we need to accomplish or need to, need to work well in. For example, these two people on the left right here, uh, they're turned away, so their faces won't be visible, so obviously face detection won't be working well. And for the guy doing the handstand, uh, a lot of face detectors wouldn't pick him up as well, uh, mainly because they usually assume some kind of canonical face position. A step up from this is to maybe try something like person detection or person segmentation. Now, this is slightly more robust uh, in that we can find people in a wider range of environments. However, we're still missing just a little bit more of the context that we need to be generating a, a smooth and natural experience here. Let me give you some examples. Uh, let's say this person on the couch uh, is run through a person detection algorithm. You're going to see that this person is going to be some kind of oblong shape in that region. So now how do you begin to frame someone like that? And if you have to zoom in, like, you know, where do you, where do you go next from that? The person standing behind the couch and the person on, on the ground um, are also a problem because they have very similar segmentation profiles. And yet the context of what they're doing and where they are fundamentally play into how the smart camera should move to begin to frame these people. So what we've done, and unfortunately this is about the extent of what I can say about this, is that we've built an AI system that allows us to observe where people are, but not just that, we can observe how people are standing, how they're sitting, how they're moving, and other bits of relevant information about them and their environment, and we can then feed all of that into our smart camera engine, which makes decisions about how we want to move uh, the smart camera itself. So the idea of smart camera is not necessarily new. 
but most of the prior research in this space deals with this in an offline processing fashion. Obviously, in an RTC context, we don't have this luxury. Uh, we actually have a very small compute window, and we have to make decisions very quickly. Uh, we don't have the ability to view the footage end to end, so we can't make globally optimal decisions that you could have done in these prior, such as in the prior research. And so the best that we can do here is just to move as quickly as we can, and then we have to guess about what we need to do, correct for the error, and just move on. So in that sense, speed is of utmost essence. Uh, we've worked very closely with our hardware vendors uh, to really optimize our models down to run efficiently on device, and we really had to squeeze every little last bit of juice out of that system, which is a mobile chipset. Um, we've also wanted to make sure that all of our models run locally on the device uh, to ensure that we don't have to wait for that potentially flaky network round trip if you have to do some kind of cloud-based processing. So it's really important that we get this information quickly, uh, not just from a throughput perspective, but also from a latency perspective, because we have to make decisions about the here and now. Right? If it takes you 500 milliseconds to observe something about the world, that information is suddenly now 500 milliseconds out of date, even if you're really confident about it. So sometimes it's a little bit better to make it a little bit less confident, but a little bit faster, because that boosts the relevance um, of what you need to observe and do with that information. And combining all of that, that helps us to build um, a very responsive overall smart camera. Now, a lot of people think that once you get uh, these AI algorithms running on the device, that you're pretty much good to go. And generally, I would say that might be true if you're going to build a demo or a prototype. When you're building a product like Portal, where the smart camera AI needs to run seamlessly in line with the core video calling experience, uh, you really don't have any room for error, right? Because if you imagine if you're in the middle of a video call and every couple minutes when you turn to the side and it does like a weird leap, right? That's a completely unacceptable experience. And so the Portal AI team has put a good amount of effort into making sure that we build the product in a way that leverages the strengths of the AI, but also has methodologies to compensate and hide the failures as they're occurring. Uh, on the topic of the look and feel of the smart camera, uh, I'm just going to say that uh, we found this space to be very, very subjective. Like Everyone kind of wants it to do something slightly different. And we surveyed a wide number of users and even film professionals. And what we've generally seen is you know, there's not a whole lot of consensus here on what it should do at any given point in time. So the best that we could possibly do here is to try to find a solution that kind of strikes a, you know, kind of a happy medium between all of these opinions that still generally shows what most people expect to see, but fit within the constraints of our technology, and hopefully isn't too annoying or uh, obtrusive to any given one person. Uh, now, a lot of people, when they're first presented with this problem, they initially say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this, the end result of this looked like I was watching a film of some sort? Uh, while we have derived some of the basic techniques for the smart camera from film, we've generally found that film isn't really the perfect analogy uh, for what we're doing. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in a video call with your mom. While you're talking with your mom, you know, she may be listening to you, but what she might actually be looking at might be your two-year-old playing on the ground, and that's what she's actually interested in. Now, in film, if you're about to say something interesting, it's not uncommon for them to cut in on a, for a close-up of your face to really make emphasis and to show the emotion as it occurs. Right? Uh, but in our case, like, if that's not what your mom is looking at, that's actually incredibly distracting. So what we need to do is we need to build our solution uh, such that we're really enhancing uh, the engagement between active participants and we're not there to really tell a story or an idea because really you know the real world is unscripted in that sense. Okay now I'm going to turn this over to Arthur who's going to cover the uh, RTC bits in a little bit more detail. Thanks Eric. Uh, so yeah now we have this uh, nice camera with providing us a customized image of what we want to see but we actually want to plug it into a call. So at that point, one of the challenges is what this is, and really also for just changing the frame resolution you're feeding into it. So we actually approach this by just feeding a fixed 720p image uh, to RTC, which actually means that we may have to upscale it again right before passing it on if the image that the camera was zoomed in too deep. 
Uh, the next thing is that this is all about an experience for the receiver. We want them to, to view the image in a, how they want to view it. And so to do that, we actually wanted to give them the ability to control the video they are receiving from the other side as well, to some extent. Uh, that is similar to what we saw on the demo, where basically to, you have an option to either let the automatic camera decide to just frame everyone on the, on the image, or you can choose a spotlight mode where you select someone on the screen that you want it to, to focus on and track around. Uh, to do that on the receiver side, we actually, of course, have to know where these localizations are, so you can just click on that screen. We don't want to reprocess what has already been processed on the, uh, on the capture side to understand those locations, so we actually have to send that information somehow to the other side. To do that, we actually went with the data channel, basically sending the tracking information for each of the frames, as well as the timestamp from, from that frame. Of course, this has an inherent issue, just like with any other different channels, where the packets may arrive out of order, the timestamps are already translated again to something else. And so one of the approaches to solve it will be, OK, instead of the channel, we could have went with an RTP header extension to just input data directly on the frame packets themselves, but that will be a little bit more troublesome with a little bit more uh, code changes everywhere and some other like uh, codec specific things as well. So instead, we just noticed we can leverage the AV sync module that's already doing the work to try to estimate what was the original timestamp from the video side to synchronize audio. And we just use the same approach to synchronize the f localization information as well that allows us to display that a green little frame on the screen as you're trying to select who you want to, to look at. Uh, with that information in hand, then we can just select uh, whatever is the best synchronization of the information you have to display on the screen in real time. Now, great. So we have this uh, great experience between the two portals, but it turns out that most of the people you will be able to be in a call with will be on a regular phone on their messenger app. And now we have two problems. One is, first, many of these devices won't be able to, won't be able to afford receiving a high quality video. They may be on cell network, they may not have enough battery, or they may not have harder support for decoder. And as such, we have to send them a lower quality video so they can actually keep up with the call just fine. But at the same time, if you also have another portal in the call, we don't want the portal experience to degrade and have this bad quality just because of poor device loss in the call. So at this point, we basically have to send at least two different video streams to, uh, for the different uh, use cases. For that, we basically employ simulcast. Uh, simulcast, of course, has a few options. Uh, some of them would not uh, be a very good fit here. For example, we want to have the ability to do arbitrary low or high quality as the devices may be completely different. We can't just get stuck with something like a temporal scalability with a multiplier of what we actually send into each of these uh, uh, receivers. At the same time, also wanted to avoid server-side encoding. Like we have this powerful device that has the ability to actually encode multiple streams at once, and so we just went with that approach. It's the device uh, will encode multiple videos and send those out, and then the selective forward unit will just figure out who to send it to. But there is still one more piece, which is even across messenger devices, it may not make sense to send the same like low or medium quality to all of them. Because as you get more people with the call, they may choose different layouts for their screens. They may be seeing <coughs> one person as the focus in full screen, or they may be seeing everyone in just like a grid view format. And it's probably not the best idea for in all cases to send the same bitrate and network video stream to all of these uh, different cases. So basically, it will look something like this, where uh, one of the example use cases is you have two portals and two messages in the same call connected on a group call through a, a server side piece. And the portals may have a high network because they're Wi Fi plugged in at your home. Messengers may have a, a low or medium network quality, may have high as well, and may have, have a different uh, screen layouts. And we have now to figure out okay, you have the ability to send multiple layers. But how do you decide, how do you determine what quality to send on each of these videos? Like, who's going to receive what? To address that, uh, we implemented this uh, bitrate allocator server module that takes all of these inputs from all of the participants that call at the same time. 
like what are your downlink and uplink uh, bandwidths, what is your screen layout, what are your capabilities, and makes a centralized simultaneous decision to come up with what is the best matching of all of these forwarding layers and what should I ask each of the portals to upload in order to not only avoid wasting a bandwidth or not to just upload three or four layers if you don't need to, but still optimize all of the receivers so that they can get the best that they, they can afford. So in that previous example, it would basically potentially look something like this, where each of the two portals are actually uploading two layers, but with different qualities, because one of the receivers has a, a low network capacity, but is focusing on one of the portals. So that same medium layer from the uh, first port on the left would be able to accommodate both uh, the master use cases. And meanwhile, for the other participants they call, they have to send a low-quality video to the first message on the left because they, they doesn't have enough bandwidth to take other high-quality videos from everyone else. Of course, this is just one example uh, solution. It is possible that if the, depending on the actual network values and everything else, the other portal may actually decide to send three layers. Like you may send a low and a medium if they're different enough so that it can accommodate both of the messages separately. Uh, basically, there is a lot of room for exploration here, uh, a lot of customization, depending on all the, the values we receive. And uh, that's pretty much it. Question.